The musical modes. A lot of people think their only purpose is to confuse guitar players. But the truth of the matter is, modes are extremely useful and practical tools for any modern composer, because modern music is filled with modal harmony. In this lesson, I've assembled seven different demonstrations and examples of how you can actually use the modes to write awesome sounding music, starting with some very basic ideas and closing out with some more complex ones. Now, everything I'm about to teach comes directly out of page 295 from my new book, The Signals Music Chord Progression Codex. It's a thorough, comprehensive guide into songwriting and composition with a strict focus on chords and chord progressions. If you visit my site now, you can get the digital version as a course, and depending on when you're watching this and where you live, you might be able to get the physical version as well. So we'll get started with the very first way to write music using the modes, and this is also the easiest way to write with the modes, but a lot of beginners still get confused and stuck at just this spot. The idea is we're only going to use the notes of one mode. We're gonna restrict ourselves to just those notes. And that'll allow that mode's inherent colors and flavors and smells to bloom out of it. To demonstrate, we'll use the A Dorian scale. Here are those notes, and if I use just these notes, I can create these different triads. These are the only triads you can create using just those notes, all right? So technically speaking, if I'm using just those notes, and those chords, I'll be in A Dorian, right? But ask yourself, does this really sound Dorian to you? You know, we're told that Dorian is smoky and wistful and stuff like that, but this doesn't really sound that way to me. And the reason is, we're not promoting our tonal center. We're in A Dorian, right? Well, we need to have a strong presence of A. So somebody somewhere needs to be like blaring away at the note A, or we need to constantly coming back to that note A. Anything to put the focus on A, then we'll have the A Dorian tonality. So right now, I'll just have some background instruments play the notes A, and we start feeling, oh yeah, we are in A Dorian. We could also have those notes play an A minor chord. That would give me more of this A Dorian tonality. So the idea is if you want to write in a mode, only use those notes and keep a tonal center, keep a strong tonal center, right? Really focus on your tonal center, maintain it. Now to actually compose with this, here's what I've done. I've written a chord progression that goes A minor, A minor, D, and C. That keeps the focus on A minor just by giving us two A minor chords right in a row. So we're kind of comfortable with A minor feeling like home bass right now. I've arranged those chords onto a harpsichord and in 6-8 timing. Because to me, there's like no better duo than 6-8 timing and the Dorian mode. The two go together just wonderfully. to add another layer to that. So I just picked two notes from every chord and I just layered them in there on strings. There wasn't any rhyme or reason, I just played around with what I liked the best and here was the other layer. Next, I picked a flute patch and I wrote a melody. I'm not gonna go into detail on how I wrote the melody here because I made a 20 minute Patreon video on how that's done and I'm posting it publicly on my Jake Lizio channel. So you can check the description below to see exactly how I crafted this melody. on top, I decided to harmonize this using the exact same principles and strategies I taught in my last video on harmony. So there we go, a piece that is purely in the Dorian mode, exclusively in the Dorian tonality. Now the next way I want you to think about writing in modes is to use the mode like we just did, but feel free to break that mode structure if you want to. If you find something desirable that you want to do, that's fine. You're allowed to leave Dorian behind. You don't have to restrict yourself to it forever. For example, A Dorian starts off on this A minor chord, right? This is the tonal center of A Dorian. But A Dorian naturally has a G note in it. It normally has a flat seven. You know what sounds really good next to an A minor chord? It sounds really good to play G sharp, the leading tone, because G sharp kind of pulls us up, right? It gives us that nice little uh, resolution, that flare, that fire. If, we, if we're allowed a G sharp, we can play an E major chord. G sharp allows me to play this chord, and that's a wonderful chord change. E major to A minor, 
But you can't do it if you're in Dorian. Who cares? We're going to do it anyways. We'll be in Dorian because we like Dorian. We like that wistful, nostalgic, adventurous flair. But you know what? If we want a little bit of drama, we'll bring in the leading tone. We'll bring in this E major chord. Now here's the thing. Dorian has a flat seven. We're bringing in a major seven. We don't want those two to ever happen at the same time. So when we decide to introduce major seven, we're kicking out flat seven of the party. Major seven takes over completely on everything in the harmony, in the chords, in the melody. You really don't want to have two sevenths floating around at the same time. Now to put this to use, here's what I'll do. Same exact chord progression as before. A minor, A minor, D, but instead of C major seven, I'm just going to go to E seven. Right? So we've got this chord progression that has a little bit more fire to it, a little bit more mm, drama. So here's what it sounds like, and once again I've done that layering thing where I took two notes out of every chord and I put the strings on there. So I like that simple little chord progression. It's great and it's technically complex. I mean if you look at all the notes floating around in there, that cannot fit into a single key. That cannot fit into a single scale. Now let's take that old melody we wrote and just dump it on top and see what happens. Okay, so I hope you agree that something went wrong there at the end. Our chord was playing an E major, right? That's our new chord that we're bringing in that features the leading tone. It features G sharp, our major seventh. Well, the melody is harping away on flat seven, G natural there. So this is a mess. This is exactly what I told you you need to avoid. If we're going to bring in major seventh, we need to kick out flat seven. And the reason this is such a crisis is because we're trying to present an E major chord. And all of a sudden we're hearing a G natural note, which would help me create an E minor chord. So to fix this, it's easy. We just take that G, lift it up to G sharp, and boom, it's fixed. Now the second half of the melody is already good to go, because if you look here, well, the chord is E major and the melody is E major. So sometimes you just get lucky, you don't even have to change your melody. So putting that all together and then adding in the harmony the second time sounds like this. I think it's worth rewinding a little bit and listening to the first version as well and comparing it to this version. Is one of them better? Is one of them worse? I don't think so. I think it's completely on which one is, you know, appropriate. So there's no better or worse here. There's just different options and which one is better for you at a given time. The next way I want you to think about writing with the modes is to perform a relative modulation. This means we stay within one scale, but we change what our tonal center is. This happens a lot between verse sections and chorus sections. A lot of times, a verse section will be in the minor key, and then the chorus is in the relative major key. A good example is Pink Floyd's Comfortably Numb. All these chords that comprise that progression in the verse are B minor, right? Strong B minor tonality. But all of a sudden the chorus has come in, and the tonal center changes to D major, right? And it's like, oh, all of that darkness is washed away. We're in this bright, happy, like, complete tonal shift. But we didn't change keys. It's still just these same seven notes. But we've, you know, cast our gaze on a different tonal center. Now, this only works if you spend time on that new tonal center. You really have to promote it. You have to brainwash the listener into believing, hey, this is, this is our new home base. But we hear it all the time. Another example is Mr. Jones by the Counting Crows. Those verses are strongly in the key of A minor. The choruses are strongly in the key of C major. So what key is the song in? It's like Heisenberg's key. It is the key of C major. It's the key of A minor. It's neither key. It's both keys. It really depends on what section are you looking at. You know, if you look at just the verse, yeah, it's in A minor. If you look at just the chorus, yeah, it's C major. If you look at the whole song, uh, it's, you know, it's performing this relative modulation. But what I've prepared for you is a demonstration not between major and minor, but one of my other favorite relative modulations between Phrygian and minor. So here's all the notes and chords of E Phrygian, which are the same as the notes and chords of A minor or C major. It's all the same stuff. But our focus is primarily on this three triad, E minor. We're really going to focus here. If we go to another chord like F major 7, we're just going to pop back to E minor. We'll bring in a D minor, we'll just pop back to E minor. This will give me that E Phrygian sound. And you're going to hear that in the song that I wrote here for you. But then you're going to hear the tonality kind of drift away and you're not going to kind of have that solid E minor bass anymore. And we're going to have kind of an ambiguous tonality before things smack right into the key of A minor. 
which again is the same notes, but we're gonna be focusing on A minor as our new tonal center. And your ear will be relieved. You're gonna be like, oh, this is where I was supposed to be this entire time. Because inherently, Aeolian or minor is just more stable than Phrygian. So take a listen to how this all comes together. I think it sounds really good. And also a big thank you to Beardstank for ripping out the drums on this one. He absolutely killed it if you take a listen. <laughs> So that was a relative modulation. We didn't change scales at all. We didn't change notes at all. We just changed what our tonal center is. By contrast, a parallel modulation means we are gonna have to change some notes. The most common way to do this is to start on a key like A minor, and then to somehow modulate into the key of A major. They both started on A, that's what parallel means. And like I said, major and minor is the most common way to do this. You'll hear this in George Harrison's um, While My Guitar Gently Weeps, which is in the key of A minors for the verse, and mostly in the key of A minors. It breaks the structure a little bit like we talked about. But then later on, the verses come around, and the verses are purely in the key of A major. And it's just, you know, it's like the, the sun comes out after a cloudy day for something. And pretty popular change. You'll hear it in old classical music as well. One interesting example I like to bring up is The Sign by Ace of Bass. That starts off in this really cool G minor based synth groove. But then the verses in the rest of the song just like pop right into the key of G major. Now you're not limited to going from parallel major to parallel minor. There's other options as well. And the ones I would recommend are sharing these three. These three all share a major tonal center, mixolydian, major, and lydian. So I think it's a good idea to try going from parallel major to parallel lydian or something like that. Likewise, I think that these minor ones are really, really good parallel shifts. Going from A minor to A phrygian is a fun modulation, or going from A minor to A dorian. But you are gonna have to change some notes around. You know, Every time you switch from minor to one of those, you're gonna change one note. And same thing, if you're starting in major and you're changing one of these, you are gonna have to change a note to get there. To demonstrate, here's a chord progression I've written that's in pure A major. We've got an A major 7 chord, and then we've got E major over D, and then regular D. Once again, A major 7, but this time we're going to an A major chord over D, and then an E7. Back to the same progression we started with, A major 7, E over D, D, and then we've got our 2 chord B minor 7, and then the 5 chord E7. That's pure A major, right? That's got all the flavors and drippings and, you know, scents of A major. It's happy, it's joyous, it's beautiful. But what if we just decided to go into A Lydian? We're gonna all of a sudden go from this happy, joyous, stable, you know, major sound to this disconnected dreamland. So that's what I've prepared here using that same chord progression. We're gonna get into the world of borrowed chords. The easiest way to think about this is to write in the major key and then borrow from pretty much anywhere. So I'm gonna consult the ultimate modal poster up here. I'm gonna be in the key of C. I wanna write using all the chords in the key of C, right? But if I wanna bring in something weird, I could literally grab any of these. I could grab in flat two from Phrygian, you know, or I could grab in flat six from, you know, my. Sometimes some of these chords are shared. Sometimes you don't know where you're borrowing from. All you need to know is that if you're in major, you can literally grab any of these chords and you'll probably get something that might work out. 
you know, if you if you borrow too many too quickly, you can lose track of your tonal center really quick. But this chord progression here that I've composed uses quite a few different borrowed chords, and it still maintains its C major, you know, tonal center at the end of the day. Now, learning how to play over every one of these chords is kind of its own topic on its own. So instead of dealing with that, I've just arranged it as a big, huge chord progression. I've got organs, we've got choirs, pianos doing it. I've got giant power chords playing every one of these. And then I have lead guitars, literally just playing the most of the time, just playing the thirds of each chord. And then I've doubled that an octave higher. So hopefully it's just a giant arrangement of a kind of a simple chord progression. I mean, to compose it, I literally just started here at the top of, you know, major, and I just selected some other ones in between. And here's what we got. That's like an epic sound and modal mixture, which is what borrowed chords really is. Modal mixture usually has this epic sound when you're in major keys. But that brings us to our sixth topic, which is writing in minor and employing modal mixture. First off, what does writing in minor really mean? Well, it means what we talked about in number two of this video, right? In the second example of this video, I said, you're allowed to write in a scale and then break that scale sometimes. And that's really what writing in minor means. Most minor bass songs, like songs that are in B minor, often include a leading tone, right? It's just part of the package. If you're gonna have a minor tonal center, even if even though the minor scale has a flat seven, you're probably gonna see leading tones. And that's what people mean when they're writing in minor. So if you are writing in minor, what I strongly recommend you do is avoid bringing in major thirds. So in B minor, for example, I really don't wanna hear a D sharp note, right? D sharp's really not gonna sound good. I don't wanna bring in any chords that include that D sharp note. If I just go to a, you know, a D sharp chord, that's really abrupt to me. If I do a D sharp minor chord, once again, we've got these chromatic mediants, it's a very ghostly chord. So if you wanna write in minor and use modal mixture, here's the easy thing to do. Write in minor and borrow from Phrygian or borrow from Dorian. Those are easy scales to borrow from and you will never drag a major third into the house. But also keep in mind that writing in minor also means bringing in major sevenths and kicking the flat seven out of the house. So there's a lot to juggle here when you're actually writing in minor. And I didn't actually write you a progression for this section because I can't top the progression I'm about to show you. It is literally the greatest chord progression in rock and roll. It is the canon D of our generation. Hotel California by the Eagles. We have a B minor chord, which is our tonic. We bring in F sharp. This introduces the leading tone and it kicks the flat seven out. We have A major. That's just the natural flat seven major chord in B minor. E major, you can think of it as being borrowed from Dorian. All of a sudden we've introduced the natural sixth and we've kicked out flat six. G major, well that's just the natural flat six, that's the diatonic chord. D major is a diatonic chord in B minor. E minor is a diatonic chord. Back to F sharp major, the dominant chord. So if you analyze that whole chord progression, you can't fit it into a scale. You cannot fit it into a key. But we would just say it's in B minor. Because that's the kind of stuff that happens in B minor. When you're in minor keys, you see leading tones. You see natural sixths. It's kind of a common thing to see. And the guitar players in the band knew exactly what was going on here. You can hear it in their lead playing. The very first lick highlights the A note, which is the flat seven. But then just a second later, we get A sharp. So they knew that the leading tone had to be introduced there and there shouldn't be flat sevens. And just a second later over that E major chord, well, all of a sudden we have a natural six, we hear a lick that accents that natural six bringing in B Dorian. So hopefully that gives you some insight. If you know your minor-ish modes like Phrygian and Dorian, you've really got some great options to choose from when writing in minor. You can bring those chords in for a little bit and then return back to your minor key. Now, for the last strategy, we're gonna kind of widen our opportunities here a little bit. The idea here is that we're really using scales and modes just to play on top of a chord. So you see a chord, well, match it to a scale, play it on top. Who cares what the chord before was? Who cares what the chord afterwards? Just, oh, you see a cool chord? All right, play a cool scale on top of it that matches that chord. For example, here is the chord C major seven sharp 11, right? 
I think of this as one, three, five, seven. That sharp 11, you can just think of it as a sharp four instead. And so if this chord pops up out of the middle of nowhere, you should be able to ask yourself, hey, do I know a scale that can fit on top of that? Well, yeah, if you know your modes, you know that the mode C Lydian contains all of those notes. So I could just play the C Lydian scale on top of that chord in any context, and it will work you know, in some way. Whether it matches what happened before or afterward, I don't know, but it'll match that chord. But if I've got a chord like C dominant seven with a sharp 11, there's no mode of major that's gonna work out with this chord. You'll have to find a different scale. And fortunately, there's a scale called Lydian dominant. That's a mode of melodic minor, and that fits right on top of this chord. So what I've done is I've arranged this chord progression. This is a lot of weird chords. And for each chord, I've just picked out a different scale that I can just dump on top, right? There's not a lot of grace here. It's like, okay, weird chord, weird scale. Weird chord, weird scale. There's no tonal center. There's no tether. There's no overarching plan here other than let's just play weird chords and match them. So you can guess, just by me describing it, this is going to be a kind of a strange sound. It's not the kind of music I would ever choose to write. It's not the kind of stuff like, oh, I picked up my guitar and listened to this thing I wrote. No, this is purely the result of like, let's do an academic thing. And I actually am pretty pleased with the results. A lot of times when you do these academic exercises, I don't get a lot of good results, but I think it turned out pretty good this time. So there we are, seven ways that you can actually use the modes to make music. But keep in mind, this is not a complete list. There are other applications of musical modes. And also keep in mind that, you know, we just did the modes of major. So really try to expand your stuff beyond that. And a mode is just a scale. So everything we're really talking about is just about, you know, introducing new scales into stable constructs like major and minor. Now, hopefully it goes without saying that if you enjoyed this lesson, you'll really enjoy my book because this literally was inspired by one page of that book. So, you know, you should be able to get a lot of mileage out of it. But thank you for watching. I really hope you found this video educational, informative. If you appreciate these videos, you're gonna have to thank my wonderful Patreon supporters for making them possible. They patiently and generously waited for two years while I made this book to return to YouTube. And really, if it wasn't for them, I wouldn't have had the opportunity to do what it is that I'm doing here now. If you'd like to join them, you can. There are links below in the description. But if you'd like to support this channel in other ways, you can just leave a comment or a like. That helps me out a lot. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.